So it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here in stereo, because there was, there was some doubt whether I would get here at all. So, uh, and it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to come here to this particular part of the world, because um, a, little bit, a tiny little bit of uh, anecdote, history from my past life. And when I was between the age of six and eight, my parents uh, lived in Belgrade, and we used to come for our holidays here in Sapta. I don't know if any of you know Sapta, it's just, just down the coast from Florida, and it's where I learned to swim. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that tomorrow maybe I'll have a chance to get into that, to that sea again. So, uh, and the other reason, the other reason it's, a, it's a privilege to, to talk to you um, is that I, I believe this is my 22nd visit conference. Uh, and to be asked to do the, the plenary is, uh, is obviously a great thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this, what's, what's culture got to do with, with business. Um, why do I think that's important? Since about 1990, I've been trying with my colleagues to establish culture and intercultural training that's very central to our, to our discipline. And in a way, I'm disappointed with, with how far we've got. It's still, I feel, fairly peripheral uh, in terms of, of what we're doing. Um, and in a way, it's not only peripheral, I think, for the profession, but for you, perhaps, uh, but it's also fairly peripheral for our clients. Um, and as I say, despite my best efforts and other people's best efforts, Putting it at the core of, of what we're, we're trying to do to help our participants to be successful communicators, successful international business people, I believe is, 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 is even more important now than it was 20 years ago. So uh, this is my opportunity over the next uh, hour uh, to convince you of that and hopefully to give you arguments which not only convince you and your colleagues but also help you to convince your, your clients as well. And there will be an opportunity after I finish, I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes or so, uh, then I hope uh, there'll be a chance to share some experiences from the audience. Um, the plan for, for this session is to start by talking about the challenge that faces, that faces our, our clients. Um, I'm, just, I'm just sort of thinking about this word challenge because over, over breakfast, Vicky, Vicky was saying that, you know, that really what, what you mean is the problem. Um, but I'm going to talk about the challenge. And I, the way I'm going to talk about the challenge is I'm going to use a very well-known sort of paradigm for, for looking at intercultural competence and divide it into three parts. Um, I'm a bit disconcerted about which one I'm going to point at. But I think, I think I'm going to point at this one here. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, knowledge. I'm going to talk about the sort of knowledge that I feel our participants in companies need to have about uh, culture and business. And then, then, of course, I'm going to talk about the skills uh, that they need to develop. And briefly, but probably in the end, most importantly, I'm going to talk about attitudes. So, those three levels, um, and then I'm going to share with you some solutions to helping our clients face these challenges, which I and my colleagues at York Associates over the last 20, 30 years have come up with. So that, that's the plan, and uh, then I hope that you will also perhaps share with us some of the ideas and solutions that you, uh, you have come up with. So, first point, knowledge. And I'd like to look at this through the lens of several companies. So I picked some companies. Um, the first one, uh, those of you who, who sort of know what I've been doing over the last 20 years won't be surprised about this first client, Nestle. Nestle is the real sort of daddy of multinationals. Um, 286,000 employees, nine to over 90 countries operating. Uh, 150, 60 years of operating internationally. So, in a way, I, I've been lucky to work a lot with Nestle because I've learned a lot about what it takes for this sort of multinational uh, to be successful, and also uh, the sorts of uh, the sorts of challenges that they they face. So, I, I picked Nestle, and I'll talk a little bit about Nestle in a moment. Um, 
But I've also picked another client, uh, really at the other end of the scale, that I've been working with the last two or three years. So this is a um, sort of one of these very famous uh, Mittelstand German companies in Kunzeslau near Stuttgart, with about 2,500 employees. They make fans, um, fans which are used in air conditioning, etc. And I think what's interesting about this company is that 10 years ago, it was an almost entirely German company with almost 100% of its business done in Germany. Now, 10 years later, 60% of their business is done outside Germany. So it's a massive, massive transformation. And again, I've been lucky enough to work with them and to try and help them uh, to, make that, uh, to make that change. So I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, I also picked Tesco. Tesco are not, not a client of mine or, or of York Associates, although I did work with them briefly. I think they're, they're very dominant in the UK as a company. You can't get away from them. They're actually the third largest retailer in the world now, grocery retailer in the world. Um, and they're interesting, I think, because, you know, very, very successful in, in the UK and rolling out over the last 10 years again a very, very dynamic in process of internationalization with some successes and some failures. So um, I, I'll talk briefly about Tesco. Uh, one other company I'll, I'll talk about this is a pharmaceutical business based in Geneva. Um, a few words about that. And finally, I just want to mention a, a non-corporate business that I also work for. Uh, because in a way, I'd like to, part of my argument would be that what I'm, what I'm going to cover in this hour is that this is not just about what we can do for our corporate clients. I think we can also do things for people working in the public sector. And Sanfo is actually a support agency that supports NGOs, uh, development aid organisations. And I've, I've been working with them recently. So these are all clients that I've got to know quite well. And so I thought it would be interesting, I hope it's going to be interesting for you to share my experiences of these clients. So let's start uh, with Nestle. So what is, what is the challenge that faces Nestle? Um, a, a quite disconcerting thing about working with Nestle is that when you sit down with a, with a group of executives, and middle managers, junior managers, they very, and then you ask them to introduce themselves, they very rarely uh, talk about where they come from. They very rarely talk about the country they were born in or whatever. Uh, it's almost a given in Nestle that the environment is international. So your sort of your roots, your national culture is is not something people dwell on. Which I think is is important for us to realise because you know maybe uh, too much focus in intercultural training on on the nation state or national cultures is perhaps a mistake the way the world is going. So uh, Nestle is maybe, maybe, maybe an exception insofar as they've been operating for so long. Um, so the challenge that I have, have, have worked with Nestle on is the one of integration. Um, and this explains why I, why I worked with, with Nestle, because back in 1988, Nestle bought a Yorkshire uh, chocolate company, uh, confectionery company, Roundtree Macintosh. So that's 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 in York, which is where I which is where I come from. Um, and uh, this has been, like many integrations takeovers, uh, extremely difficult for Nestle, and probably even more difficult for the people in Roundtree. I mean, still, when you get a taxi uh, York Station uh, and you want to go to Nestle. I mean, this is 20, 23 years ago. No, because they don't know what you're talking about. You have to say Roundtree, even though they changed the name 20 years ago. So, so that, say, that tells you something about how strong company cultures can be. Uh, a Roundtree, a Quaker, paternalistic or, you know, company, a very, very strong culture. And very, very difficult for them to uh, integrate and to understand and to work with this large multinational. Um, other integrations which uh, Nestle has um, <coughs> been involved, they've got a very big water business, that's the Perrier, they, they, they bought up a lot of water companies. Interestingly, their water business, uh, they run, uh, the headquarters are in Paris. 
which I think is, again, interesting because, I mean, Nestle is a Swiss company, headquarters in Vive, you'd expect their, you know, their corporate sort of uh, strategic work to be done in, in Switzerland. But in some of the businesses, that one and also another one here, another business which they've acquired in the last 15 years, which is their pet food business, uh, it comes out of the States, and in fact the headquarters of their pet food business is in the States, again, not in Switzerland. So, what I, what I see is, um, when I work with these groups, very, very different cultural backgrounds, but, but not national cultural backgrounds, corporate cultural backgrounds, um, and, that, and that is the challenge. And Nestle has tried to respond to this challenge.